And we are live with James Zeng from Jambo Technologies. Jambo, super happy to have you here. How are you doing? It's uh, um, as good as anyone can do in this market. I appreciate you taking the time and having me on. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Oh, I think we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of topics to cover, especially given the exotic nature of the ambitious project you're, you're currently building. But before we dive into that, can you tell us more about your background? Where you come from and how you you know how you got involved with cryptocurrencies in general? For sure. So you know, quite I guess different, uh, unique on the background side, but I think the way I got into crypto is quite similar to everyone. So I was I grew up in uh, the DRC in Congo in Central Africa, the capital of Kinshasa. I was there for about 16 years. Family's been there three generations. Um, I ended up in New York studying computer science at NYU. 2015 bought my first Ether. A lot of that was through payments online for poker, et cetera. And then fascinated by it, I think just because where I come from, you know, where you, if you send money back, a lot of that was still Western Union back then, you know, 10 to 15 points at uh, T plus three plus five. So for us, it was just pretty fascinating at that point. Fast forward, after I graduated for the past four years, uh, I ran a crypto fund. I'm lucky enough to sort of be known as the Africa Emerging Markets guy, had a lot of good deal fund the space. So... Um, fast forward this past year down the game five rabbit hole, amazed by how it changed the economic proposition in Southeast Asia and Philippines. You look at the rise of game five, the rise of multiple concepts in an emerging market. And I was, I took that same value prop of low GDP, great mobile and 4G penetration to Africa. A lot of this is thanks to the rise of certain tech giants um, in the past few years, such as Techno, who sold over 200 million phones last year, did almost 7 billion in revenue. Um, a lot of people don't know it's almost value like 30 billion US dollars at the height. You got almost um, 200 million gamers, mobile first, complete skip past PC, which is honestly where we see a lot of game five projects going today. Guys that, you know, have succeeded, like Step In, like Axie, whatever, you know, different opinions people have on it. They are probably have the highest user count in uh, the Web3 world right now. And then 75% of the population closer to 19 and 35. So obviously you see the room for growth there for the young users. But at the same time, still almost a 50% um, unemployment rate, which is quite sad, you know, especially because a lot of this is around recent university grads, et cetera. So opportunities just really aren't there uh, at Jumbo that we're seeing in Africa and various regions. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of Web2 middlemen, bureaucracy, as we all know. And what we really hope to accomplish is bring Web3 to the region. So ultimately, what we're trying to do at Jumbo is onboard the next millions of users from Africa to Web3. Okay, pretty interesting. And we've seen, you know, one of the problematics that we rise often on the channel is how to solve the the issue that's the following. You have 100 million users with a wallet, just a very primitive basic wallet, but how do we take that from 100 million to 1 billion? How do we make crypto a scene that, you know, that cannot just be switched off like a cigarette you would just drop on the floor and make everyone go back to where they come from? Because crypto is still, despite like the the, the, the trend it is right now and the amount of people using it is still kind of a big niche, you know, and it's still small enough to be attacked by, let's say, strong international agencies or governments. And um, I think that's a really interesting problem that, that you guys are trying to tackle here um, by uh, leveraging the fact that you have a high cell penetration in these emerging economies and that people are actually more connected that we, than we think. And we've seen that these kind of transformations you know, onboarding users on new technologies, etc., can happen real fast. You, you, you had this in China, I think, with, with WeChat or Alipay, and mm-hmm. you, you, you've had these one-stop solutions, that, you know, becoming like pretty much core, the core of like the, the daily lives of many, you know, the people that basically live there. So, um, yeah, the, the idea, if I sum it up pretty quickly, is to create a, a super app and a suite of initiatives, also offline, but online and offline, that would onboard people onto Web3 uh, with different use cases, whether it is creating revenue through play to earn, but also being, you know, discovering DeFi products or, um, you know, also using uh, crypto for remittances. Am I right? Yep. No, um, that's a really great point you bring up. Like literally, how do you go from 100 million to say a billion users and how do you even onboard that in an emerging market like Africa? So. Like just drawing parallels, right? Like even in an article that dropped about us lately is saying we're trying to do the Web3 WeChat of Africa. And to a certain extent, that's very true because if you look at WeChat and what happened in China, China is probably one of the fastest growing emerging markets in the last two decades. And what WeChat did was make 
one product really well. And that started off with their chat messaging function. And then from there, they become, as we just call it, a one-stop shop, you know, in the Web2 world. But the difference between China and Africa right now is at the time, other than WeChat, there was 10, 20 other messaging apps. But WeChat really just optimized the, the product the best. But the difference here we see in Africa is it's really not just about how well you can, your smart contract is or how your product is. It's about if you can create the end-to-end -end infrastructure and actually teach the people what Web3 even is. As people, there isn't 10, 20 super apps going around right now that they're choosing from, and it's just based on product. It's about that they have the access to it, they have the smartphones, but, and the smartphones here are different as well, right? In Africa, we're talking about 80 to 120 US dollar smartphones, or techno, Oppo, Vivo, et cetera. In China, it was already uh, Samsung, Apple. So now it's all about just one word, education. Um, a lot of people hear education, especially in you know many first world countries, and you think uh, charity, you think you know not a lot of growth, but actually there is no other way to onboard millions to billions of users from Africa to Web3 without education. There is no shortcut. So what I mean by education is literally if you're teaching someone about say Axie, right? Like let's look at Philippines right now. Like a scholar three months ago is making 300 bucks. Today they're making 30 bucks. So now begs the question: Do they still believe in? You know, Web3, or did they ever believe in Web3, or were just doing it to feed their family? What I want to teach in Africa when we onboard users for play to earn, whatever game or whatever economy that may be, and as we introduce this concept and create the infrastructure, is that Axie is one subset of play to earn, which is one subset of Web3. And around that, there's still a lot of other concepts that they can take advantage of to help them unlock a world of value. So ultimately, what the Jumbo Super app is, it's an app that helps you do three things earn capital, save capital, and send capital. In a way, it's sort of like a neo bank that now that doesn't need you to just deposit capital to start earning, but actually you can start earning just by downloading the app and understanding the concept of Web3 and being able to get involved. So it sounds easy when you say it, especially, you know, in Africa, there's a lot about what you want to do. But trust me, like the on ramp and off rail for each like each region, for example, Africa is a continent, you know, of like 1.5 billion people, 55 countries, 40 something fiat currencies like it's just it's it's very different like i grew up in congo right and um, that's a country of 200 million people and colonized by belgium so my mother tongue is french and the local dialect lingala then you go to west africa you know it's french and so in other dialects you go to east africa kenya swahili english so it's just very different and there is no one size fits all so for us a lot of what we're doing is trying to take a local approach and the boots to ground strategy across various regions but then bring in that same concept of uh, the Jumbo Super App. All right, so this Jumbo Super App is for now not available, but I reckon that if people that are watching us are based in Congo or basically any part of French speaking Africa, so how can I get involved? Are there like antennas in the capital where you can basically reach out to someone that, that manages operations for? For, what's the go-to way and what talents, what kind of profiles are, you know, can actually get involved at that stage to receive education, but also to build with you guys? Are there any opportunities? Yep. So uh, like, right, it's like Francophone Africa probably is like one third of Africa. So we're also in English speaking parts of Africa, the 15 countries that we're currently in. So regarding how to get involved, right? Like the Jamba Super app, you're, you're exactly right. It's pre-product right now. It's coming later in the year. What we're doing is a lot of A-B testing of various products right now locally with local um, populations and people in the region. So other than to just reach out and get involved with us online on Twitter, you know, on Instagram, et cetera, locally we have WhatsApp group chats, we have Telegram group chats of our ambassadors as we call them. Right now we have close to 100 employees locally on the ground, um, one-fifth engineers uh, working on the app, but a lot is because you can't hire anyone that's from Web3 in Africa. Like there is you don't go to a region and say, hey, I want to hire like five Web3 people. The best that you can do is someone that understands the local region really well and has done BD and scaling for other companies in Web2. And then you teach them, train them and then sort of trickle down in that way. So uh, the best way, you know, for someone to get involved with us, if it's an engineer, we've already been sort of speaking with certain groups of developers, et cetera, in Africa. And it's been quite surprising the growth and how big the ecosystem is. But on top of that, most of the A-B testing sort of people are university students or people around the age of like 20, 25. So around that is you can go to your local internet cafe, honestly, and because we have more than a few hundred right now that uh, we've onboarded where at the local internet cafe, there's a lot of things saying about Jumbo and they can actually 
start testing out and come into our group chats. And it's also benefits the cafe owner. So maybe even the universities, et cetera, they can uh, go around and find this. All right. So um, at the local scale, you just check the local um, cyber cafe and you might eventually have, uh, you know, uh, you might find Jambo there. You can just also reach out through through Telegram. I'll make sure to leave the, the relevant links in, in the description. And so you, you you mentioned or I probably read that somewhere or heard that on another podcast that your, your, your background and f for many generations, your family has been working on uh, deploying uh, communication infrastructures in Africa, am I right? Uh, so I don't know if it's just deploying communication infrastructure, but more so it's just my family has been in Africa for three generations. Probably, uh, ethically, I'm Chinese, I'm Asian, but we're probably the first, one of the first Chinese to like immigrate uh, to Africa. So that's still you know home for me in Congo. Um, but regarding local communication infrastructure, if you were if you've been in Africa for three generations or this long, you've deployed capital or you've invested in infrastructure in one way or another, which is how we sort of have some of these connections to local telcos, et cetera. Like 4G penetration is great in Africa. Like 4G penetration in certain countries might even be better than second or third tier cities in China. Now, the problem here is that the, it's, it, the prices have never gone down because it's monopolized by a few telcos because they are the ones that set up this infrastructure. So if you have a way to actually bundle data packages and resell that, especially in a scalable way online through your application, that is sort of serves as the backbone for whether web two or web three um, for the African local user. All right, all right. And lately you've been closing um, second round with a set of prestigious backers, um, basically supporting like the Jumbo project, fueling its development. Um, usually when uh, such events happen, there's always the ID that there might be a, a token that glues the experience, like all the aspects of the experience together. Uh, would you be comfortable telling us about um, what would be the, the eventual t token logic that would exist on the, on, on the Jambo ecosystem? How did you guys uh, f think of it? No, of course. No, that's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, like you said, we're very blessed that uh, we just closed our Series A um, and we raised from some of the best backers in, in Web3 especially. Um, I think we're like most of the company, most of the fund's first investment in Africa. And I think for them, it's mostly that they see us as the on-rails for the users. Because it's like I said, in Africa, it doesn't matter how great your product is if you don't have the expertise to locally onboard users. So um, very lucky that these backers, for example, as we're testing out games, et cetera, we're concerned partners, like for example, Delphi Digital, for example, like 32-bit, the guys that see every you know gaming deal flow out there and they're able to support us and you know sourcing through so the amazing, crazy amount of companies there are in Web3. Um, and then you've got other guys that work better in DeFi, et cetera, like Synthetics, that have been helping us think through the models here. Um, so yeah, going back to the token model, the Jumbo token essentially will be the native token inside of our app um, used in various uh, parts and services. For example, when you earn, you can stake. This goes to the DeFi component. For example, when you send capital, you know, reduce trading, you reduce fees, reduce trading fees instead of our decentralized swap. So any part of our product that has a use case or a fee will sort of be earned and distributed through the Jumbo token. And sort of that is where the value accrues. Now, Jumbo token is the governance token, but where we don't do anything really complex. Like, first of all, I, I'm a big believer that one token is just a lot simpler. Okay. Okay, and you said that the, the, the token can basically like would be part of pretty much all the experiences, all the aspects of, of the app. Uh, what would be your strategy to, you know, because at some point, because crypto is very sovereign and open, people might want to actually do what they learn through the app, through uh, an, another app or a self-custodian app or something like that. What's your take on that? What yep. would you the users to Jambo? some extra features that you would only find in the app. First, there is the comfort of having a suite of items and solutions in one app, but would it be something like extra, like that meshes the users of the app or something like that? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Especially in crypto, I feel like there's so many great teams building right now. Like if you look at wallets, right? Even beyond MetaMask, who has the most users, you have Rainbow, you have a bunch of other wallets, you go to Solana, there's Phantom, Soulfair, et cetera. So like what stops the users from changing around? I think for us, we, we never really set out thinking it from the space of like, let's capture the user only in our ecosystem. 
it's like I told all of our partners, like Africa is such a huge market to bring Web3 there. We need the best partners, et cetera. That's why we had like 172 investors across the two rounds. So honestly, anyone that wants to build in Africa, we've been super supportive and sharing data points, sharing our local resources, helping do local due diligence even with our team on the ground. So regarding like how we can stop users from going to other, I actually hope there's a lot of other option, options for users in Africa to go to beyond just Jambo. Um, but regarding like how we think of our business model, um, it's like you said, one-stop shop. It has to be a one-stop shop. You look at WeChat, started with messaging, but if they just got comfortable there, you might have a WhatsApp situation where you get sold to a bigger conglomerate. But obviously WeChat had much bigger plans and now captures pretty much every uh, user in China. Well, for us in Africa, in the one-stop shop model at the core, it's a highly extensible digital wallet. Uh, but there are other digital wallets in Africa. But then around that, on the earning component, I think is what's the most interesting where, like I said, it's sort of like a bank that helps you earn. And a lot of that is going to come from the play to earn side and the games we're going to introduce that directly through Jumbo, through having that on their phone, they can be earning capital. And then from earning capital, they can now save and earn more capital through staking, which is sending, um, et cetera. And a lot of that will be through the Jumbo you know, token, which is how we hope to keep it healthy in the network. So long story short is we hope that there are other partners that you know, are – huge competitors of ours in Africa, because that will bring more awareness for Web3 and onboard users, which is our ultimate goal. But at the end of the day, our business model is creating a one-stop shop for users um, where they can seamlessly not only learn about Web3, onboard through Web3, but understand this is the app that help, helps them earn and send and save capital. Yeah, you can imagine M-Pesa flipping into crypto. They could be, uh, you know, out of nowhere, very brutally, like a whole ecosystem of uh, money streaming and uh, rem remittance applications flipping into crypto. And, you know, Africa, just with my knowledge, is to me a place where corruption is also very strong, as in some places in Eastern Europe. There are a lot of civil wars, um, it seems. Um, how do you mitigate the risk of um, having this, you know, messing, messing up with the development of the initiative in some very unstable zones? Like, for instance, in Congo, you have the northern Kivu, which is just like always, um, you know, uh, torn by war. And you have like the militias killing each other. That's like very sad. How do you, what's your strategy to, to handle this potential instability? No, uh, I think this question, you hit it on the head. Uh, it's exactly right. There's a, it's one of the most unstable regions, especially Congo. It's rated always like top five most unstable countries in the world uh, every year. Like when, even for myself, when I grew up, I went through two civil wars, one in like elementary, one in middle school. One time I fled to Togo, another two. You know, the point of my story is, People there are actually, through civil war and through disruption, they understand crypto better. So it actually speeds up adoption. For example, like when I, like imagine you're, you're, you go through civil war in Congo, you have to leave home within like eight hour time frame. What do you bring with you? You know, you can bring um, a, an array of things, but if you can just remember your private keys or bring your ledger with you, then you actually bring your whole world with you. Similar to what we see a lot of uh, folks in uh, LATAM today as well in certain countries. So. Congo or Africa in general has two to 10 X inflation compared to any other country outside of Africa and governments are overprinting. You look at Zimbabwe, you look at Congo, you look at uh, Kenya, et cetera. So users there and local and, you know, young guys are more uh, susceptible and open to change and open to new currencies. So that is something that I feel like from the bottom, from the stem is what makes Africa such a great market for crypto, which, you know, as, seen by data it's grown by 12x in the last year now regarding it uh, stopping a lot of development because of instability that is also true this obviously ties in with governments and central governments that you know uh, bans the central bank from opening accounts and working with crypto type companies as we've seen in nigeria i think in africa that's just the price of business where things are unstable can you react and flip on a dime to change and be sort of tied in in a way to understand what the political powers are thinking, understand how the uh, banks are thinking, and certain regions are obviously more favorable than others. So even though we're in 15 countries right now, how we budget and how we work, you know, Congo is 200 million people, Madagascar has one one hundredth of that. Like, obviously, you're going to budget differently and test out various regions. So um, for us, I, I don't think it's going to be an even spread of web the adoption across Africa. I think. All right, pretty cool. Now, you know, as we... As we usually do in this podcast, we tend to ask our guests uh, what are also their takes on uh, the market, not whether it's going to go up or down, but what are the 
the technologies, the initiatives, the DeFi protocols, the solutions that you, you find most interesting at the moment. Some of them, you don't have to name them all. And uh, yeah, we would be very curious to know, you know, have your, have your insights, know what you actually like. Yep. I don't know, you know, how much you do to step in, you know, I'd love to have a conversation about it, but you asked me what is some one of my favorite, so it's not a protocol, but a game. Uh, is that they've, I think I walk one hour and a half every day because of Stepin. And, you know, obviously I think the payouts, you know, I don't know how sustainable it is, et cetera, but it's gone my family to walk more and to do more as well, so, which I think that's the whole point of Web3, right? And onboarding users from Web2 to, to, it's not actually just about a token incentive, it's actually about, you know, what you can do. So I'm, I'm a big fan of what they've been doing too. Yeah, crazy. I mean, like it's, it's been hectic and th despite, you know, you can, you might question the, the way the tokenomics are engineered, whether it is a pyramid scheme or anything, we're not here to discuss that. But it's actually really huge because a lot of people around me that actually didn't didn't bother having a walk or running are not actually doing it. And uh, you can think of a lot of evolutions of that concept where you could potentially have health authorities <laughs> funding potential incentives to keep the stream going as, you know, you could have a budget to prevent, car you know, heart disease <laughs> that would actually go into the app. And hopefully that could, uh, that, that, that could serve like the, the you know, the, the missions governments uh, have to, you know, right. life expectancy. I mean, Perfect. yeah. It's, really it's not like they came up like overnight, right? It's not like Jerry and Jan, like overnight step and just did what it did. Like we started the cohort, I think in January. And in January, when I started to like, I was a beta test user for them. And then I think they're still on phase four or whatever, but it's been three months. And every week I sort of see how they upgraded the UI UX. They brought in more users. They got onto the app store, integrated their governance token GMT instead of GSC. And, I think that's exactly how, you know, a team should be building in the space and the speed. I think that's super speed. And they really hear what their users and the cohort like Chow and Will Robinson and Imran said at Lions Dow. And I think that was pretty amazing. So um, I don't know like other protocols teams as well, just because we've been so heads down building a Jumbo and doing our raise and everything in the last half a year to nine months. But one company that I did follow very closely was Stepin and the team there. So I can speak to that, that step by step. I saw that growth. Uh, and do you plan to how do you do you plan to take a, a break this year at least like one week you know um, make make sure that your your private and professional life actually uh, you know balance out. Well, the, the only private life I have is I play basketball like an hour or two, like four times, three times a week. That's it. Um, other than that, staying single and uh, you know heads down building is 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 comes up. You'll be surprised how much time extra time you have being single. I'll say that. <laughs> I think you, you you sleep like four or five hours because I remember you taking call at, at very odd odd times and I I guess you have to sync with pro a lot of your backers that are actually based in North America but you're in Asia but you also have to sync with Africa that must be like uh, pretty terrible. Yeah, I, I can't complain though. I think most builders in this space are sleeping four to six hours and everyone is cross time zone, which is the which is what draws people to Web three, right? Decentralized, you can work from home. It's high efficiency, so. Being in Asia right now, like obviously dealing with you know um, backers in North America and then our team in Africa, it's it's quite tough. But uh, I think eight hours is always the is like the best performance drug. You know, I always try to sleep eight hours before, but ever since start, starting Jumbo, I don't think I've ever gone six. So four to five is has been all right. Has been all right. Okay, I mean that that's been a great rollup about what you've been uh, doing on Jumbo. I think we need to do that in three months to see like what has been accomplished and have like proper tracking of. Um, uh, what's been going on on your side, guys? If you have any word to share with the, the French speaking community, what would it be to, to close this podcast? You know, honestly, I, you know, I would try to do this in French, but I, I think I can only speak fluent French these days after, you know, drinking one or two cocktails. So I'll stick to English. But no, I, I appreciate you having me on. Like I said, I love your following. You know, I, I love the article in French that you dropped on us. And I think that's actually something that's very great to share with Francophone Africa. You know, maybe I'll drop a note to any of the builders in Africa or the people getting involved in Web3 is that we're going to our initiative of Africa DAO starts uh, very soon in Q3. It's essentially Jumbo's ecosystem fund. As, as we've expanded over the last six to seven months, we're seeing a lot of partners locally that uh, we would love to get more in, uh, aligned with that we can back, that they can back us um, and essentially fund a lot of programs in Web3. Uh, to spearhead adoption, whether that's from education side, 
uh, or that's to something directly, it's a startup already and no need for the education. It's a founder that has a lot the talent in Web3 to bring to a local region. Um, it's something that we're very excited about beyond just Jumbo's infrastructure. So it's sort of like the WeChat Tencent model where everyone knows WeChat, right? The super app of China, but no one knows that, or not a lot of people know that Tencent is the largest tech PE ecosystem fund in all of Asia because it invests and works with all of the partners of WeChat. So similarly as what we're trying to do with Africa DAO is make sure that we can fund and start a lot of initiatives in Web3 as we build in the region for the next decade. Yeah, um, thank, thank you very much, uh, James. As usual, guys, you'll find um, all the relevant links in the description if you wanna get in touch with um, James and his team. And of course, full disclosure, I am an angel investor in Jumbo because I think that this initiative is relevant. It is my first exposure to a market that I have no knowledge about. I believe that there is a potential, but you should do your own research. This podcast and any content that you find on Journal du Coin is not a financial advice. Should you have any questions about the product itself, feel free to ask them in the comment section below. And if I'm able to answer them, I'll do it. Or the Jumbo team might as well come to answer them. James. Thank you very much for being among us and uh, I get to see you soon. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate you.